Good morning and welcome to the Deanery Garden at Canterbury Cathedral on this Wednesday the 12th of January. We've come out into the garden very early this morning because we have a busy morning in the cathedral today. We have the funeral of our friend, we've been talking about Judge Nigel Vanderbilt who was the recorder of the city and his wife Loba and children Antonia and Alex will be coming to the cathedral for a service where we shall pay tribute and give thanks for his faithful service to this city but in the company of friends and intimate family and uh, so we've started early the sun was not up when we came and it hardly is yet but the lamps are less necessary now and in front of me <coughs> to the uh, west the sky is pink and beautiful over the cathedral, so it should be a nice day. We shall go on from the funeral this morning to the lovely churchyard at Nackington, little country church for the burial of Nigel there. And we're sitting aptly under the Elanthus tree, which is the tree of heaven in the, it's an, uh, an ancient Chinese designation, but in English the tree of heaven. And the tree is opening its branches to the uh, heavens above as they dawn in a moment I think in great glory when the Sun comes up it's promised to be a nice day so wherever, uh, wherever you are in the world please bring your own concerns and prayers as we pray together O Lord open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise your light springs up for the righteous and all the peoples have seen your glory <laughs> blessed are you sovereign God King of the nations, to you be praise and glory forever. From the rising of the sun to its setting, your name is proclaimed in all the world. As the sun of righteousness dawns in our hearts, anoint our lips with the seal of your spirit, that we may witness to your gospel and sing your praise in all the earth. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. The night has passed, and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and for ever. Amen. Our psalm this morning, on the twelfth morning of the month, is Psalm 62. On God alone my soul in stillness waits, from him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold, so that I shall never be shaken. How long will all of you assail me to destroy me, as you would a tottering wall or a leaning fence? They plot only to thrust me down from my place of honour, lies are their chief delight. They bless with their mouth, but in their heart they curse. Wait on God alone in stillness, O my soul, for in him is my hope. He alone is my rock and salvation, my stronghold, so that I shall not be shaken. In God is my strength and my glory. God is my strong rock, in him is my refuge. You put your trust in him always, my people. Pour out your hearts before him, for God is our refuge. The peoples are but a breath, the whole human race a deceit. On the scales they are altogether lighter than air. Put no trust in oppression, in robbery take no empty pride. Though wealth increase, set not your heart upon it. God spoke once, and twice have I heard the same, that power belongs to God. Steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay everyone according to their deeds. We've been reading this week the book of Ruth, and as we've said each morning, it is a country tale setting a scene at Bethlehem and the fields around and setting a scene of ordinary rural life, the rhythm of the seasons, 
the barley harvest, the wheat harvest, the reapers going out to take the harvest. So we've come here onto the lawn of the deanery, <coughs> which, as you know, last year we allowed to grow up and seed and have lovely meadow orchids and all kinds of flowers. Now it has to be prepared for a year when we expect to be giving hospitality on it again. So much to uh, Fletcher's uh, disappointment that the wildness of the lawn will begin to disappear as the grass is cut and rolled and prepared. And we can watch that happen through the early months of the year up until the time when, again, hopefully, and with God's blessing, the Lambeth Conference will gather here at the bishops of the Anglican Episcopal world in July and August. And the lawn will then become, as it will on other occasions, a place of mighty hospitality. But for the moment, it's what we should call tussocky, and it needs to be reaped, not with reapers, but with a high mower to begin this, so we do it properly. And I'm going back now to the book of Ruth, and uh, we are in chapter 2, and I shall read uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to the beginning of verse 17. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabite, said to Naomi, <coughs> Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain, after him in whose sight I shall find favour. And Naomi said to her, Go, my daughter. So Ruth set out and went, and gleaned in the field, after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then Ruth fell on her face, bowing on the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes? that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner. But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward will be given by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then Ruth said, I have found favour in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. But at mealtime Boaz said to Ruth, Come here and eat some bread, and dip your morsel in the wine. So Ruth sat beside the reapers, and Boaz passed to her roasted grain, and she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, 
and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. It's a story we'll continue and it's a story of good faith in the fields in the middle of the barley harvest, a seasonal story of beginnings in Bethlehem. And today we see simple rural qualities of good faith and gratitude being exercised by Boaz. Ruth, a woman and a foreigner, says, why should you why should you care for me like this and say such things? And he says, because I have heard of how faithful and loyal you have been to your mother-in-law. He simply says, after your husband's death, but he might also have said, and after her, Naomi's husband's death as well. How you've left your mother and father and come to a people you had never, never known. And here you are in a foreign land, gleaning and we shall show you kindness. So don't leave my fields, but glean here. The gleaning is one of the rules and laws in the book of Deuteronomy particularly, that people are allowed to glean after the reapers, pick up ears which have fallen. And Deuteronomy goes further because it, it says, just leave the edges as well, leave some grapes on the vines so that people who come who are more needy have something of the generosity that the Lord is supplying in the harvest field. So Ruth begins to glean in safety among the women of that land of Bethlehem, but also amongst the young men there who are servants of Boaz. Now she's been told to stay on his property. And notice how when Boaz goes to the workers, the young workers, he, he says, it's a very familiar greeting to us, the Lord be with you. And they answer, the Lord bless you. It's a godly morning greeting at the beginning of a, a harvesting day as Boaz's young workers reap the barley field. How many of our Lord's parables are set in a context like this of sowing and reaping and people about their business seasonally of trees which grow and give shelters to the bird, of leaven giving life to the, the, the flower of the dough, uh, all of those things of, of country folk and the ordinary rhythm of life. And we remember how many people in the world are still involved in that kind of life. I think probably a, a, a much lower percentage in this country, much, much lower, but in some areas of the world, very much those rhythms of life. And hard work with very early mornings and late nights, seizing the opportunity and being patient for the crop. Jesus uses those images and parables so many times and in the context of the Creator's good gifts in rural Galilee or even in uh, Judea around the, the area of Jerusalem. But Bethlehem is very much uh, a city of Judah and uh, Boaz is of that tribe and clan, the tribe of Judah. So he has come to his field and made a discovery in a settled landscape. But perhaps to give this context, let's go back to Genesis chapter 8, where the verse is God's first promise after the ark comes to rest. And Noah offers a sacrifice, and God returns the promise, while the earth remains, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. It's a lovely harvest anthem we used to sing and still is sung I'm sure in places. So it, it happens today that we have an event uh, which I only really was conscious of very early this morning that an actor 
uh, Gary Waldhorn has died and we have many memories of him. He was a Royal Shakespearean company actor uh, and played Henry IV in that and, and acted with Judy Dench, I think in All's Well That Ends Well, and was in many television programmes and very well known to us. But the one thing that marked his career for years, really, because he was in every episode all the way through from the 10th of November 1994 is his role as, shall we say, uh, the local big house and, and squire almost, the, 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 the chief man in the village of Dibley, as the vicar of Dibley, Dibley's chairman of the council there, the parish council it's called, which is actually an amalgamation in their terms of, uh, of a parochial church council and a parish council. And uh, of course Dawn French is the vicar of Dibley, and he at first can't get his mind around the fact that a woman has come to be the parish priest of the parish in Dibley. And when that series began in 1994, so often a, 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 a comedy series will last for a short time and then one remembers it, but this just took the nation by storm and it was one of Dawn French's greatest roles She's been in so many wonderful things, but this is how we remember her as, and think of her. Uh, and uh, sadly, um, uh, Gary Waldhorn has died. So I wanted just to, to think of why this series took the nation by storm, because it's set in just such a community that we've been thinking of. And some people are massively conservative and don't want any change at all. And others are thinking, oh, come on, let's, let's give this a go. And uh, the Vicar of Dibley, Dawn French, is, is uh, in the middle of all of that with great good humour and tremendous vocation and tremendous faithfulness. You remember Howard Goodall wrote a lovely setting to be sung of the, the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures and green pastures uh, um, symbolises the, the story of Ruth, but also the, the life of the village of Dibley, which <laughs> became the nation's property year in, year out. There were Christmas specials, there were Easter specials, and it went on and on until really quite recently because uh, the, the cast there were quite small and we got to know them all. The vicar, played by Dawn French, Geraldine Granger, she was called, and she and the verger, lovely Alice, who was played by Emma Chambers, uh, who has sadly died now, um, and uh, Emma Chambers and Dawn uh, French would actually meet in the vestry as the verger and the vicar at the end of each episode, and uh, the vicar would tell a joke and the, the Virgil would never ever get it uh, and you could see the puzzlement on her face, on the vicar's face but the jokes often, beca because of her not getting it, became utterly hilarious and yet Dawn French trusted Alice's loyalty, as with all of them. It's a, a series in a rural setting of enormous affection, of great kindness, of m mighty impatience with one another and of people posing in a way that uh, our friend who has died uh, uh, on the 10th of January, uh, Gary Wardhorn, played David Horton, who was himself a very conservative English country gentleman, and his rather dim son, Hugo, the young man played by James Fleet. Uh, in all of that, uh, you, you, you had a, a, a knockabout between father and son, and the son occasionally trying to rebel, and Dawn French coming in with one idea after another as the vicar, and uh, the expressions on, on David's face, David uh, 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 Horton's face, um, were just extraordinary. And uh, it gave us enormous pleasure with the seasons of the year, Christmas and Easter and harvest, and people began to understand something of the rural life 
of the English church in the countryside and also what it cost, I don't mean in terms necessarily of, of financial resources, I mean in terms of service and, and of, of people singing in choirs, playing organs, being the centre of a community in all sorts of ways, not just in worship but in all manner of ways in life. We had the meeting, always in the, in the series, the meeting of the, the council would take place with David, David Horton uh, chairing it. Uh, and uh, then, of course, we had uh, Frank Pickle, the clerk, who was played by John Blutel, uh, who was uh, pedantic about the minutes of everything. And uh, a farmer who really cared about nothing much, Owen knew it, and would come in. He cared about his cattle and his sheep and his pigs and would come in um, from, generally from the farm, telling some story or other. Uh, and uh, then uh, who else did we have? We had, uh, oh yes, Tre Trevor Peacock as Jim Trott, who prefaced every sentence, even one that was going to be affirmative, with no, 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 yes. And uh, it, it became another catchword with all of these things. Different characters, different personalities within a community that knew itself, not necessarily agreeing, falling out, fighting, coming together again, reconciling, spotting the qualities of each other and encouraging. And uh, last of all, perhaps I should mention uh, lovely Liz Smith, who, who died um, some years ago now, who played Letitia Cropley. And she was a lady who uh, sat at the parish council knitting and always brought uh, delightful things in her mind that she had cooked in the kitchen. Uh, and. Uh, uh, she had a, a radical way of adding ingredients so, so that uh, uh, we tease one another sometimes because I'm very conservative about food and don't like too many things being added to it and so experiments in the kitchen are not something that I generally approve of but sometimes like of course but uh, one remembers that uh, she brought a Victoria sponge cake with its sweet jam in the middle and uh, cut it and gave it round and <laughs> the, the faces as they bit into it uh, were uh, an absolute picture and uh, Dawn French says, oh that's a, a very interesting taste and she said, yes, well I thought it needed spicing up so I put some Marmite in it. And then on another occasion she brought chocolate sandwiches and the same thing <laughs> uh, happened uh, and uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, somebody asked, what is this flavour? And she said, well, it's a chocolate sandwich, but I added some taramasalata. And uh, this kind of thing goes on. Well, that's something that we so much give thanks for, that series now. So I think six of the eight actors and actresses have now died. Um, but it went on for so long from 1994 and did great good for understanding the ways of the rural church. And I would want to say this morning that the rural church at the moment, the little parish church, we're going to Nackington this afternoon for the burial, a beautiful country church. And when I was in the countryside in Wiltshire, way back in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, and was the uh, rural dean, as it was called, there were priests in every parish, more or less. Uh, I had a, a, a big country church and two little ones, which was easily managed with help, and two retired clergy who helped out there. But now, uh, the rural dean there, uh, or the area dean, I don't know what they call them in Salisbury, but, but uh, the parishes that are staffed with a priest, those priests will be looking after huge groups of parishes. It's not only so in England, in France there are priests looking after 25 parishes or something of that sort, which means you can spend very little time getting to know the life of each small community. And uh, financial resources are one thing, but human resources very much another and the sense of musicians being available to come and sing and play and teach the children to sing and the sense of rural schools and rural resources. We as a church have always had a strong line in that pastoral ministry and this is a, a perhaps a moment to flag that as the pandemic has hit that ministry hard with those country churches and the church needs to take a responsibility for that as, as the, the months of this year unfold. 
This is a day also, I just mentioned this, because it's the same kind of delight that English people feel uh, and people across the world feel uh, for those small communities. It's the day that Dame Agatha Christie died in 1976 and she, in the Guinness Book of Records, is the best-selling novelist of all time. But one of her favourite characters, of course, is Miss Marple, the detective, ordinary lady, uh, not to unlike, uh, they're very different from uh, Mrs Cropley that I was talking about, but sitting knitting and not um, pretending to, to not to notice anything but noticing absolutely everything and set in the small community of St Mary Mead, another idyllic rural place where all kinds of things are happening and people notice one another and encourage one another and greet one another in the street. Well, there's one other thing that I wanted to mention this morning, and this is the story of a creature, because we're told that Magawa, the heroic rat, he was an African giant pouch rat, who was trained by a Belgian charity called Apopo to alert human handlers to landmines and where they were. And he became absolutely expert. He was so light that in walking across the landmine he wouldn't set it off but he would recognize where it was and we are told that uh, uh, Magawa could search a field the size of a tennis court for landmines in Cambodia we're talking about where there are there are thousands of landmines dropped from earlier wars um, and we were told he could search the, a field the size of a tennis court in 20 minutes and it would have taken uh, human beings with metal detectors up to four days safely to do that. So that after a life of clearing 141,000 square meters of landmines safely, Magawa was allowed to retire last June and was given the PDSA Gold Medal for Heroism. It's like a George Cross for creatures. So that sometimes our ways of doing things are done better by creatures who have a sensitivity and the right size for, for doing all of those things. So we remember Magawa and the patient people who trained him and apparently until uh, a few days ago he was quite healthy and then began to slow down and died quietly after his months of retirement. So I'm glad he had a, a time of retirement between last June and now. All those things in a settled rural community and the qualities of that. There are qualities of urban life, there are qualities of life all over the world in different kinds of communities. But this morning the uh, Vicar of Dibley and the story of Ruth has actually given us a chance to think of settled English rural communities which are really under threat. So let's say our prayers at this occasion and the sun is now, actually the sun is beautifully now on the on Bell Harry Tower. So it's rising but it's not got high enough not to come into the garden yet. We're praying this morning in uh, our diocese Sorry, let's start with the Anglican Communion. We're praying for the Diocese of Jamaica and the Cayman Islands, the church in the province of the West Indies. And we pray in this diocese for Justin, our Archbishop, for Rose, Bishop of Dover, and for Emma, Bishop at Lambeth. And on this day, we're praying as a diocese for all children and young people in the diocese. Well, we would think of that especially here because our cathedral school, our king's school, and our choristers who are uh, trained to, to sing down here and who, who live here, I can see the smoke of their chimney uh, ascending as I sit here. Um, our choristers who go up to St Edmund's School in, in the city here are all back now. So there's the noise of children about their work and uh, they have returned mostly uh, despite the pandemic and, and life is beginning to be ordered in an, a, a, a regular way again. So we're praying together as a diocese for children and young people and those who have a special ministry with them. Here is our prayer for today, so bring your own intentions and concerns. Eternal Father, who at the baptism of Jesus revealed him to be your Son, anointing him with the Holy Spirit, grant to us who are born again by water and the Spirit 
that we may be faithful to our calling as your adopted children, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So, a moment when we say our the prayer that our Saviour taught us in whichever language we like to use, and then a moment for reflection. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So a moment for our own reflections and concerns. It's hard to think back now to 1994, but at that time, uh, women priests in the Church of England had not been able to be ordained for very long. And I should say that the Vicar of Dibley opened people's eyes to the way in which they were thinking about that. And David Horton, by um, embodying uh, what you might call simply a, a conservative way of thinking, well, I don't want any change. And then getting to know in a, a, a knockabout way in humour with Dawn French's scripts and gradually over the years, a completely different perception began to open up. 
But at the same time, of course, over the years, the service of women who had been deacons for many years in the, in the parishes and, and now uh, were ordained as priests, and now it, we take that absolutely for granted throughout the ministry of the Church of England. Uh, but as that happened, uh, at the same time, there was a humour going on at, at, at the, the, in the background of this extraordinary series, which did some, some um, wonderful things for changing attitudes, not only with the Royal Church, but with the, the, the uh, ministry of the Church of England itself. So we give thanks for all of that. Christ, the Son of God, perfect in you the image of his glory, and gladden your hearts with the good news of his kingdom. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you, upon those whom you love, and those whom you would pray for, today and always. Amen. This is a shortened version of a show that we've done um, a few times um, over the last um, ten years. <laughs> um, the original show was called The Labourer's Year, and then we've um, recently sort of right, um, reformed it slightly and changed a few songs around, and then we call it Labourer's Year 2, and this is the shortened version, so this is Labourer's Year 2 and a half. <coughs> so, um, so <coughs> basically, it's about um, it's about labourer um, around about 1860 and um, 1900. Um, so a year in the life of labouring man about that period. And uh, we're just going to sing some of the songs that sort of uh, tells you about the the sort of period and some of the songs and some of the things he would have got up to throughout the year. So, and we start in September. And we start in September. Best time to start, as as can be told from halfway through the first line of this song. Come out, tis now September, the hunter's moon begun, and through the wheat and stubble we'll hear the frequent gun. The leaves are turning yellow and fading 
hanging in to red. And the ripe and bearded barley is hanging down his head. All among the barley, who would not be blind? While the ripe and bearded barley is smiling on the side. The wheat is like a rich man who's sleek and well to do. The oats are like a pack of girls are slim and dancing too. The rye is like a miser, both sunky, lean and small. And the ripe and bearded barley is monarch of them all. All among the barley, who would not be blind? While the ripe and bearded barley is smiling on the side. The spring is like a young maid who does not know her mind. The summer is a tyrant of most ungracious kind. The autumn is an old friend who pleases all he can and brings the bearded barley to glad the heart of man. All among the barley who would not be blind With frost and wind and rain The snow upon the hanging bough And ice out in the lane And we around the fire sit One bitter winds to wail And drink to old John Barleycorn His own good nut brown ale All among the barley Who would not be blind While the ripe and bearded barley It's in the time of haying, our partner. 